Thank you. Thank you, Dr. John, Charles Lavelle, Susan Antler, and other colleagues from AECA and uh, other collaborators. <clears throat> it's really a great honor and privilege to be able to talk to you today. I must also thank um, AECA for cooperation with them. <clears throat> and I feel greatly privileged to give them a title of Goodwill Ambassador and share in Soul Science for such a prestigious uh, inter-American organization uh, in existence for um, almost 30 years. The topic <clears throat> that I was given today to talk about soil, the essence of life. I would like to begin by sharing with you <clears throat> the idea of Carl Sagan. Uh, Carl Sagan, an astronomer, astrophysicist from Cornell. And uh, he said, <clears throat> when he looked at the Earth's image from space, look again at that blue pearl in this space. That's here, that's home, that's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was lived out their lives. Aggregates of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father and hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every aspiring politician, every super leader, every saint and sinner in history of our species lived there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. I think that summarizes how precious this little blue pearl is, and how privileged the humanity is to inherit it. And we thus have an obligation to protect it, to restore it, to cherish it, and to pass it on to the next generations better than when we obtained it from our forefathers. That brings me to the question of what soil is, because the topic the title given to me is very much soil, the essence of life. That was stated very nicely by a colleague, friend, a very well-known soil scientist from NRCS. He was a director of the Soil Conservation Division, Richard Arnold, right now retired. And he wrote, hello folks, do you know who or what I am? I'm the geomembrane of the earth. I'm your protective filter your buffer, your mediator of energy, water, and biogeochemical compounds. And since I'm your sustainer of productive life, your ultimate sources of elements and the habitats are most biota. I'm the foundation that supports you, the cradle of your myths and the dust from which you shall return. I am a soil. That's beautifully poetically summarized, listing all the ecosystem services that soil creates. And it also states that soil is a continuum between the continuous cycle of life and death. In fact, soil, if you take that as a coin, it has two sides, life and death, and they are separated by the geomembrane of the earth. That is shown also by Charles Kellogg. And the introduction that Jean Charles Lavelle gave about the earthworm and the book that uh, Darwin wrote before even the original species, the molds of the earth, he called them, these earthworms, the intestines of the earth. And Charles Kellogg said, essentially, all life depends on the soil. There can be no life without soil and no soil without life. They have evolved together. In fact, if there was no soil, the life as we know it would not have existed. So soil is indeed life. I was talking about how the life and death are transformed through the soil here is a clay particle. This clay particle has mostly negative charge. It also has some positive charge. 
on the negative charge particles are attracted to the cations, calcium, magnesium, potassium, nitrogen, either coming from decomposition of organic matter or applied through chemicals. But the decomposition of organic matter by microbes transform the dead biomass into elements that can be actually absorbed by plant roots. So here's a plant root, root hairs, and these root hairs are absorbing the nutrients, mineralized from the biomass by microbes. And this process of nutrient absorption and transport by roots, the organism which helped us release those nutrients is really the essence of life. Therefore, rhizosphere, the root hair soil interface at a nanoscale is the only place in the universe proven where death is resurrected into life. Therefore, we might as well call it that the soil, a living soil, a fertile soil full of biota had the divine powers to change death into life, as you have just seen in a cartoon depicting how roots absorb the nutrients released through mineralization of organic matter by biota. That brings us to the question of soil quality and soil health. They are related, but not the same. The soil quality or functionality is not directly synonymous with soil health, but they can be used interchangeably and sometimes they are, but one is a component of the other. Soil quality is an umbrella term. Soil health is a biological component of soil quality. Soil quality related to soil functions are what it does. Whereas soil health presents the soil as a finite and dynamic living resource. Therefore, soil health is directly related to plant health. And I'll come back to that point in a moment. So soil health is a journey and not a destination. Why I say it's a journey? Because its definition, its um, uh, concept, its uh, functionality, uh, its view, its values change with every generation as the ambition and aspiration and goal and objective and mission of each generation change. Therefore, it's a destination. It's not a fixed point. The objective and mission change of each generation uh, changes the definition of soil health. For example, the Bible depicts Moses stating around circa 1400 BC as their disciple enter Canaan. You know what land Canaan is. And he said, see what the land is like. Remember this language similar to what Richard Arnold definition I was giving you, very similar. See what the land is like and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? How is the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees on it or not? Do your best to bring back some fruits of the land. And in this five line paragraph, all the essential ecosystem services provisioned by healthy soil are beautifully illustrated. That was 1400 BC. Now, in the ancient Asia, in India, in this valley, Chanakya, in fourth century BC, he was the minister of economics of King Maurya. <clears throat> he wrote a book, Arth Sastra, translated into English. It means the book on economics, Artha is economics, Sastra is book. It explains manuring, the word manuring, compost, listed in it vividly. And it states, and other systems of soil fertility management, so that the farmers can produce more revenue for the king. <clears throat> Shizing in BC 770 to 440 in the Book of Odes in China, explains agricultural practices dating back to Zhao dynasty. A compilation of 305 poems covering ancient life in China and also describing land, farm, animal, plant, 
and agronomy. <clears throat> in the 12th century BC, <clears throat> in the Moorish uh, Spain, there was a Moorish philosopher. His name was Ibn al Awan. In 12th century, this philosopher stated in a book called Kitab al Falaha, an Arabic Kitab is book, al Falaha, agriculture, book on agriculture. The first step in the science of agriculture is the recognition of soils and how to distinguish that which is of good quality and that which is of inferior quality. And then he goes on to say, he who does not possess this knowledge lacks the first principles and deserves to be regarded as ignorant. I'm afraid we have a quite a lot of people who still are ignorant because they cannot distinguish between a good healthy soil and a soil that is not healthy. But more importantly, they do not know how to protect the health of the soil and how to restore it and sustain it. But this quotation is very nice. The next phrase which he stated is even more important. One must also take into consideration the depth of the soil. For it so happens that its surface layer may be black. And you know what that means. Surface layer is black because it has high humus content, high soil organic matter content. And soil organic matter content is the essence of terrestrial life. It is the source of energy on which the biota in the soil lives. This is what the question I was raising that the health of soil and plants, how they're linked. That was the opening lecture of Sir Albert Howard to the Indian National Science Academy, where he was president in 1920 and he was based in a city called Indore. I'll come, that's in central India. I'll come back to that Indore city later. But the title of his talk to the Indian Science Academy in 1920 was the health of soil, plants, animal, and human is one and indivisible. The word ecosystems and environment was added more recently but he stopped the health of soil, plant, animal, and human. And that is why he wanted to design a compost pit, how to convert biomass into compost. And I'll be talking about that later. I defined soil health and quality um, uh, later, but before that, uh, John Duran uh, defined as a chair of the Soil Science Society of America committee. I was also a member of his group and he said, the continued capacity of the soil to function as a living system within ecosystem and land use boundaries to sustain biological productivity, maintain the quality of air and water, and promote plant, animal, and human health. You can see the ecosystem serves the quality, biological productivity, quality of air and water, and promote plant, and animal health. The direct reference to climate did not appear in this definition. At that time, in the 90s, <clears throat> climate was yet not a major issue. Therefore, it was overlooked in the definition. I wanted to improve upon that because <clears throat> the word climate wasn't there. Therefore, I wrote the definition, soil's capacity as a dynamic and biological active entity <clears throat> within natural and managed landscape to sustain multiple ecosystem services, including net primary productivity, food and nutritional security, biodiversity, water purification and renewability, carbon sequestration, air quality <clears throat> and atmospheric chemistry, elemental cycling for human well being and nature conservancy. So I broadened the scope and I wanted to mention the word carbon sequestration, but at the same time, I did not want to forget nature. If you go back to the definition of Duran, 
uh, the climate and nature are both missing. The focus is on human health and well-being, not nature. <clears throat> and uh, somewhere, nature must not be overlooked because human are part of nature. Human are not nature. You cannot stop at human well-being. You have to have nature protection, well-being, and conservation as well. Otherwise, soil health for human only is not complete. Soil health McCune uh, defined also with very similar to what I had said, condition of a soil in relation to its inherent capability to sustain biological productivity, maintain environment quality, and promote plant and animal health. But I think that word environment, I would hope consider uh, all aspects of nature. So then a healthy soil, if you were to look at it, physically hold it, it should look something like that. Remember that black color that uh, even Alavon mentioned, mind it, the surface layer may be black. Here it is. And it's full of roots, root hairs, those roots that are absorbing nutrients, the cartoon that I showed you. And it has earthworms. Some of those holes of the earthworm you can still see. There might be one. <clears throat> but the microbes, which are feeding on these, you can't see, but you can certainly notice them. And very beautiful structure, angular blocky, subangular blocky, granular, uh, low bulk density, high porosity, a uh, dynamically changing living entity. And that black color, that dynamic biologically active living entity is given to it by soil organic carbon, the soil organic matter. And this soil organic matter impacts <clears throat> soil physical properties or physical quality, especially water, its retention, its transmission, uh, its uh, uh, filtering and leaching and purification, and soil structure leading uh, soil tilth and aggregation, uh, its chemical properties, including nutrients, including cation exchange capacity, which I showed you nutrients which are positive and negative charge, uh, and organic matter also has charge, therefore that has those uh, functions as well, and the biological one, such as soil biota for nutrient cycling, for providing energy, a microbial biomass carbon, increasing biopores, and I showed you some of those examples, and ecological properties. <clears throat> and those ecological properties are essential for the eco-intensification, which I'll talk about in a moment. Elemental cycling, increasing physical chemical capacity of the uh, nutrient. Nutrients should not leave the ecosystem and the productive capacity when those nutrients are transformed into photosynthetic net primary productivity. And all of these four characteristics determined primarily by dynamics of soil organic matter content put together is called soil functionality. It's capacity to do ecosystem services all the way from what Ibn and Alwam and Chanakya and uh, other uh, philosopher of ancient times uh, describe what they were looking for. Soil carbon, which I just explained, and now I have broadened the scope from soil organic to soil carbon. And the soil carbon has two distinct but related components, organic and inorganic. Organic is more important in terms of the plant growth, but inorganic is also important. So organic, we have live material, fauna, microbial biomass carbon, plant roots and so forth, which are live, and detritus material, which may be undecomposed or decomposed. Decomposed means it has all been humidified. And the decomposed one may be protected by clay. You remember the clay I showed with a charge, electric charge on it? So because the organic matter has a charge, it can be absorbed by the clay particles through the cation bridge forming what we call organomineral complexes. So it's protected, or it may be unprotected. That means it's still floating within the soil matrix and is not associated with clay particles. And the unprotected might be dissolved organic carbon. It may be particulate organic carbon, POC, or it may be macro organic carbon. Then we have inorganic carbon. 
And inorganic carbon is two types. One is called lithogenic carbon. Lithogenic is the carbon carbonates, bicarbonate, which are derived from weathering of the parent rock. And then we have pedogenic carbonates. And the pedogenic carbon are those carbonates which are formed through the pedological or soil processes. And the soil processes act something like this. You have a live biomass, you see this arrow, and this biomass is being decomposed by organism, atherm, termites, microbes, fungi, bacteria, and they release carbon dioxide. They absorb energy, and through that energy process, their respiration, they release carbon dioxide. This carbon dioxide from the biomass, when it is dissolved in water in soil, it becomes carbonic acid, a dilute carbonic acid. And if in soil, we have added to outside sources, calcium, magnesium, potassium, for example, by wind deposition or water deposition or through irrigation or through application of soil amendments, then those cations react with carbonates and create carbonates. With react with carbonic acid and create carbonates. And these carbonate of calcium, magnesium, potassium now formed through soil processes, we call them pedogenic carbonates. And this process of pedogenic carbonate formation with a long life is carbon sequestration, just as this process is carbon sequestration. So formation of carbonates and bicarbonates through this linkage is also soil carbon sequestration. And it should be assessed and it should be quantified and it should be monitored. The methodology is different and maybe a little bit more expensive, but it needs to be done as well. Coming back to the organic matter, which affects crop growth, <clears throat> I like to indicate that organic matter, which I showed you as a chart, and <clears throat> now we can look at it as a pie chart. And pie chart, most of it, <clears throat> stabilized organic matter, which I explained to you what it was, about 33 to 50%. The active fraction, which is still decomposing, microbes and earthworms and their biota are still eating it, another 33 to 50%. We have fresh residue, which is not yet started decomposing. And we have living organism. And living organism about 5%. And the total weight of living organism in a healthy soil is about five ton biomass per hectare, per hectare. Now, <clears throat> when you plow, when you irrigate, when you put fertilizer, when you put pesticides, beware that there is something living in the soil. Sometimes people say, if you really know how these living organisms cry when you spray them or when you plow them or when you drown them, if you really hear, you could hear their cry. But the idea is soil is a living entity. And as a living entity, please be careful how you treat it. I'll come back to that point later. <clears throat> so in this soil, <clears throat> then, because of these elements, there are cycling, which are determined, which are driven, which are uh, caused by organisms in the soil, living entities, and they create cycles, which call them biogeochemical cycle. Sometimes we call them biogeophysical cycle. For example, water, it's very closely coupled with carbon. We try to teach them, I teach them separately, but in nature, they cannot be separated. They are really closely linked and carbon is linked with nitrogen and nitrogen is coupled with phosphorus and phosphorus is coupled with sulfur. And it is this coupling of these elements, water with carbon, with nitrogen, with phosphorus and sulfur, and <clears throat> this coupling fostered by, facilitated by, determined by, uh, enhanced by biotic activity and species diversity, we call it soil biodiversity, generates the ecosystem services that were written by Moses and taught by Ibn al-Awam and explained by Duran and other definitions that I shared with you. <clears throat> if human and climatic change and human perturbations other anthropos somehow decouple this coupled cycling that destroys the quality and quantity of these ecosystem services. So somehow 
this decoupling. Erosion is a symptom of this decoupling. Leaching algal bloom is a symptom of this decoupling. So by the time the water, the nutrients have been decoupled and they have gone into the stream and eventually in the lake and causing the algal bloom, uh, the horse has already left the stable. We should do something back on the soil to stop that movement happening for which this couple cycling is very critical. <clears throat> so if you look at the current uh, uh, carbon cycle for the last year, uh, the report that came out of the carbon budget, human beings are still burning 10 gigaton, <clears throat> billion tons, nine zero of carbon as a fossil fuel. If you want to convert into CO2, you have to multiply 10 by 44 and divide by 12. So it'd be 37 point something gigaton of CO2. I like to deal with carbon, so you see 10. Uh, deforestation <clears throat> creates another one and a half. So the human anthropogenic emission, sometimes people add cement into it, but that cement could have been lumped into this fossil fuel part, but that also releases carbon dioxide. So fossil fuel emission, deforestation, I think something missing in erosion. There are a few other things. Uh, I'll come briefly talk about them, but this is roughly approximately the source of the CO2 emission. Sinks, what happened to this carbon which is emitted? It's absorbed by the atmosphere, about five. Five out of 11 and a half stays back in the atmosphere. 2.6 taken by the ocean and the ocean components still keep increasing as the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere keep increasing. But when the ocean keeps warming up, the possibility that 2.6 will continue, it may decrease over time because of acidification and because of increase in water temperature. Then the land absorbs the remaining part, what we call the residual. So if you combine the ocean and land together, 6.1 out of 10.5 uh, out of 11.5 uh, or 50, yeah, this should have been 11.5, uh, is uh, absorbed by the natural sink. So the question is, this sink, which is absorbing without much human intervention, this much amount, can this be increased? Can we increase the land-based sink through human intervention more than 3.5? That does not mean that we should not decrease this. We must decrease this and we must increase this if we can. Somehow to the management, this of course, by finding non-carbon renewable fuel sources. Increasing carbon in the land <clears throat> is a simply a balancing technique. It's like a bank account. If you want your bank account to increase, you want to make sure that what you amount to deposit into the bank is more than the amount that you withdraw. The soil carbon bank, the withdrawal, equivalent to what we withdraw from the bank for paying our utility bills and mortgage and uh, tuition fee and so forth, um, must be always less. This is what withdrawal is. This must always be less what we add. We can add through biochar, through compost, through cover crop, through root biomass, through crop residue, whatever other things input we can add. But these are the losses. We must know what our losses are so that we can manage our input in such a way that our input is always more than the losses are. In that case, you will have a positive soil carbon budget. You will be increasing carbon stock in the soil. Unfortunately, in most cases, especially in resource poor farmers in developing countries, because they need residue for other purposes, <clears throat> whatever they'd add is always less, most cases, than what is being removed by erosion, leaching and decomposition. This is what is called depletion. This is what is called sequestration. Our objective is to follow this model. And I'll show you some example of how we can do it. If we do everything properly, 
in general, the rate of sequestration is more in a wet, cool climate than it is in a hot, dry climate. In a hot, dry climate, inorganic carbon sequestration may be more, but uh, in uh, organic uh, is much more in a wet, cool climate. <clears throat> now, we did an estimate and 15 of us got together uh, two, three years ago, and we said soils alone of the world, uh, ice-free land soil, uh, all kinds of soil, cropland, grazing land, forest land, urban land, recreational land, mine land, uh, eroded, depleted land, really could sequester as much as two and a half gigaton. Two and a half. Please remember, <clears throat> I even today said, read a report somewhere which said uh, we can completely offset 11 and a half gigaton in uh, uh, regenerative agriculture. Uh, I am sorry that's not the case. Two and a half. But please remember this two and a half is very, very important. It's not small. On this depends the food security, the nutritional security, the uh, water quality and renewability, the biodiversity. <clears throat> this is why while we can do that, perhaps we can also find non-carbon fuel sources to minimize the fossil fuel emission. We also went a step further. We said, well, the soil, what is the ultimate maximum between 2020 and 2100? All soils of the world, everything. If we turned a switch on and said, everybody is doing the best thing as ECOW says we should do. Okay, we can probably put 178 gigaton total in a year period in soil. And we can do afforestation in forest vegetation. We can put another 155. This is the ideal situation. The total potential between now and 2180 year is about 300 gigaton, which translates into 160 parts per million drawdown of CO2 in the atmosphere. I know this is not possible uh, in a realizable a real world situation. So even if we can do half of this potential, ATP parts per million drawdown, and at the same time improve soil quality, improve productivity, improve nutritional quality, improve water renewability, improve water quality, improve biodiversity, this is absolutely the highest priority. Absolutely the highest. So what you are doing through your uh, uh, mission of compost is a very noble mission and I salute you for it. I took an example here from Argentina, a friend of Martin Diaz Orita working in Pampas. A few years ago, he plotted a graph of soil organic carbon in tons per hectare versus the yield of wheat. And as you can see, he find where is the optimum. If the soils are somewhere here, which many depleted, degraded soils are, and you increase this segment by improving our, you can increase the productivity of wheat by as much as 50, 60, 70 kilogram more grains per hectare for each one ton increase in carbon stock in the root zone. And I have calculated this crop incremental yield uh, for many crops and uh, try to find out how we can do that. Now I want to explain <clears throat> 10 different principles of how to manage soil health. First part is soil degradation. Why soil degrade? And the answer is that the biophysical process of soil degradation is driven by economic, social, and political forces. We do know how to manage soil quality, functionality, health, but economic, social, and political forces sometimes are overriding. And I think that's a very important part to understand. If the farmers are desperate and they have to have more productivity tomorrow rather than 10 years from now, they will not do something that soil health may dictate them to do. And the other part is that the vulnerability to degradation, the susceptibility to degradation depends on how rather than what is grown. So it's not a question of whether you're growing corn, soybean, barley, how they are grown uh, is the most important part. The second law is the stewardship. 
why farmers should not be good steward of the land? And I think that's a very good question, very fair question. But one of the problem I have is when people are poverty stricken, desperate and starving, the stewardship does not mean anything because they pass their sufferings to the land. And land reciprocates. And this reciprocity between human suffering, passing this suffering to the land and land reciprocating continues. And you can see this, that the people are mirror image of the land by driving through the countryside, whether it is Central America, whether it's Caribbean, whether it's Sub-Saharan Africa, whether it's South Asia, compare that and come back to the Midwest US and Canada and Western Europe and you will see that people are mirror image of the land and vice versa. And that's very nicely put by O'Henry. O'Henry said love and business and family and religion and art and patriotism are nothing but shadows of words when a man's starving. So somehow, before we demand too much from farmers, we must make sure that their necessities are met. That means we should be willing to pay the price of the ecosystem services that we are demanding of the land managers and the farmers. If we are not willing to pay, we have no right to demand. And that's a very important concept in terms of the policies. And then the question comes of how much can you keep drawing from soil? I mentioned soil is a bank account. And just like a bank account, it's not possible to take more out of a soil than what is put in it without degrading its quality. Only by replacing what is taken can a soil be kept fertile, productive, and responsive to management. Please remember that. Anytime when people say soil can keep producing forever and you take away everything from the soil, that's not true. Eventually, we have to find equity. And the equity I normally mention is grains for people, residue, either applied directly or made into compost for the soil. And that equity must be maintained. Soil produce the biomass, it has its own share. Do not steal that share. That's what Sir Albert Howard called banditry. And he called it the worst kind of banditry because it inflicts wounds on the bandits themselves when they keep stealing from the soil. That's what he called the law of return, Sir Albert Howard. He said the law state that the substance we take from nature must be returned to the place from which it was taken, one way or the other. That is the law of composting. Then there's a law number four called marginality principle. <clears throat> and it states very direct matter of factly, marginal soils cultivated marginal inputs produce marginal yield and support marginal living. Think about it. Look at the poor lands and they're cultivated by resource poor farmers in a very poor means and they produce miserable yield even next door done properly gives you higher yield. And therefore the living standard of those farmers are the same. You can reverse it. A good soil cultivated with good inputs, produce good yields and support good living and protects nature at the same time. Law number five, we talk about organic and inorganic. For 7.8 billion people, I'm afraid we have to do everything we can to make sure the basic right of humanity, the food, nutritionally good, healthy food is met. That is the basic principle, that is the governing rule. And if somehow we have to supplement the organic, which is the main source with inorganic, so be it. But it has to be done properly. And by what proper I mean is produce more from less. That's one part, producing more from less 
as less as we can. The other part, which is very important, and I believe in it, and that is the difference between poison and remedy, or poison and medicine, is the dose. One aspirin taken properly at the right time may cure the headache. 100 aspirin dumped indiscriminately without rhyme or reason means something else. So properly taken supplemental dose judiciously, prudently, as needed, as appropriate at proper time, may be needed until our population stabilizes at a lower level. And I'll come back to that point also later. Soil carbon has the same effect on global warming when it is released in the atmosphere as fossil fuel emission. But on the other hand, if the soil is managed properly, it can take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and put back in the soil. So soil can be a source or sink, depending on how you manage it. You are the determinant factor as a manager, whether soil is a source or sink. Many times people say germplasm. Um, Dr. Norman Borlaug, the only Nobel laureate in agriculture, uh, very well deserved recognition. Uh, he was the one who said germplasm, dwarf varieties, uh, input responsive varieties. But input responsive varieties, their potential can only be realized if they're grown under conditions of healthy soil. If the soil is not healthy, if there's no water and nutrients in the soil, where will those varieties take it from? And I think sometimes the improved varieties can also decrease uh, the necessity of putting pesticides so that another part. So proper synergistic uh, relationship between soil-centric approach uh, that was mentioned in the introduction and seed-centric approach, they complement one another. It's not either or. Either or does not work. So again, soil as a sink uh, must be integral to any strategy of mitigating global warming, any strategy. Without that, although as I mentioned to you, it's only about 20%, remember two and a half gigaton ideal condition out of 11 and a half, that 20% is the most critical low hanging fruit with numerous other ecosystem services without which the sustainable development goals of the United Nations can never be realized. Therefore, soil must be integral to any strategy. We must make sure that agriculture is a solution to the environment. We cannot keep blaming agriculture. As long as we all like to eat three meals a day, it's our responsibility to make sure that agriculture is a solution. Engine of economic development. Sustainable management of soil and agriculture is the engine of economic development. Political stability. I'll come back to it in a moment toward the end because I think the human uh, security, the civil strife, the political stability, the war, soil, when it cannot support its uh, people living there uh, and they become refugees, internally displaced, they don't care whether they can swim through the Mediterranean or not, or elsewhere. So all of that, political stability and economic development uh, of the community and the people <clears throat> depends on soil. <clears throat> Traditional knowledge is very important, absolutely. But it cannot also do without the modern knowledge. So build upon traditional knowledge and modern innovation and come up with a holistic uh, a technique together. Build upon. And some of the traditional knowledge that I gave you example, going back to several hundred BC, uh, are very relevant. But at that time, the population was a few hundred millions. Now we are 8 billion. And we have another 2 billion coming to dinner in 30 years from today. And we have invited them. We have a responsibility to make sure all their necessities are met. And that is very important part. So <clears throat> soil fertility cannot be managed just by adding fertilizers. <clears throat> soil compaction cannot be eliminated just by flowing. Drought cannot be mitigated just by flooding the soil. Erosion cannot be controlled just by installing terraces and land farming. 
Acidity cannot be controlled simply by dumping lime in. These are symptomatic treatments. We must understand the cause-effect relationship. And the cause-effect relationship, how to maintain the soil organic matter content and the soil biodiversity and the, eco, the activity of the different species at the critical level. And the critical level of soil organic matter for soils of the temperate region is 2% carbon, 4% organic matter. So somewhere three and a half to 4% uh, carbon, one and a half to 2% uh, carbon and double of that organic matter. I keep on interchanging them. Uh, half of organic matter is carbon. So when I say organic matter 4%, it means 2% carbon. That's how they're translated. So soil and soil health must be improved. Soil organic matter content must be. That way, the dependence on fertilizer, herbicide, irrigation, pesticide, plowing will be decreased. And the idea is to decrease the inputs. And therefore, futuristic agroecosystem must be pedagogically restorative, agronomically productive, environmentally regenerative, economically viable, socially congenial, clinically healthy, clinically healthy, especially in the current era of the pandemic, and laboriously appealing. We must reduce the drudgery of the agroecosystem. And this is caused by soil quality and functionality, and of course, multiple ecosystem services that that soil can generate. Biodiversity, <clears throat> restoration, holistic, all those. So we must restore rather than deplete the soil water and other natural resources. So sustainable agroecosystem mean restore soil, recycle nutrients, conserve and purify water, strengthen biodiversity, produce nutrition rich food, nutrition sensitive agriculture. Micronutrients, vitamin must come from food, not from a pill. And that's the idea. Assessing the societal value of the good practices. And that brings me to how do you manage it? So one thing is mulch the ground. <clears throat> Mulching is plant-based uh, several types. It can be a live mulch, which can be annual or perennial. If it's annual, you can use a live mulch, a green bed, mixed cropping, relay cropping. Uh, it could be perennial. Perennial may be legume tree or shrub. Uh, which can be pruned in an agroforestry system, used as energy plantation, leave most of the other material back on the land, produce energy for biofuel, and use some for compost. If it's a dead material, it can be produced in situ through leaving crop residue on the surface by conservation agriculture, no till, zonal tillage, reduced tillage. Uh, partially, you can harvest, take away from biophysis and leave the biochar, which is fortified with nutrients back on the ground as an amendment. <clears throat> so these are many techniques out of all these, I'm going to pick up composting in a moment. But I want to show you before that, what happens if you do not leave the residue on the ground. We started this experiment in Ibadan, Nigeria in 1972. This picture was taken in 1987. We are taking two crops of corn a year. This was a practice where everything in the front was the same, same variety, same fertilizer, same tillage, no till method. There was no erosion, it was small bunded plot. The only difference of the crop residue was taken away every crop. We did not return it. You notice the crusted, compacted, hard soil, no earthworms, no termites. Even when we apply fertilizer, it's not effective. Same variety, same crop, same time of planting, residue was returned. Moisture, temperature, this soil was full of earthworm, very fluffy soil, very living, living biomass. 15 years. <clears throat> we saw whether we can do this same thing somewhere else to prove that soil biota is the bio engine of the earth. Soil biota is the bio engine of the earth. And when you take to take away biofuel purposes residue, and there is a price. Some amount, maybe you can take away one third of total, 
but find out how much is required for soil health maintenance. And if there is a surplus, yes, it can be taken away. <clears throat> we try to repeat the same experiment at Coshocton, Ohio, about uh, two hour drive from Columbus in the Appalachian region. And we repeated a plot which was under no till since 70, 1970. There was a drought in 2012. And <clears throat> these pictures were taken during the drought at the initial flowering stage. Uh, Josh Beniston was a graduate student. Uh, he is about 6.6 .6 feet 8 inch. And exactly two meter away was the plot where the, where the residue was left. And the drought did not mean anything. If you are looking for a climate smart agriculture, that's it. Return the biomass one way or the other. Do not steal it from mother nature. It also needs it. I did this experiment, uh, another one in Africa in 1971. Here's a crop of cowpeas. This is not soybean, it's cowpeas, bigna, and planted with no-till uh, after the corn crop. And I could yield at that time corn five and a half, six tons, four, five, six tons per hectare, and beans maybe half a ton to three quarter of a ton. Absolutely no problem with no-till but this technology was never translated into action. It is now being translated slowly, but not. There was absolutely no erosion problem. A uh, lot of earthworm, a lot of uh, uh, recycling, uh, soil moisture condition, temperature better. So what is a good agriculture then? <clears throat> a plant which has a good root system, not necessarily shallow rooted dwarf varieties that Dr. Borlaug was recommending, and we do need varieties which have more biomass. Deep root, association with mycorrhiza. And uh, plants perhaps that can emit some molecular based signal when they're under stress. If they are chewed by locust, uh, produce different signal. If they are drought stress, produce different signal. If they have virus problem, we can detect those signal through molecular based devices and intervene. Always do no tell leave the mulch on the ground and also grow a cover crop in an off season and make sure that we can integrate this kind of system with livestock and with the trees so we can recycle most of the thing together and if some nutrients are needed due to some reason at a given time that we realize that perhaps some micronutrients that were not available through what we were recycling apply judiciously directly to the root to drip fertigation system so that the soil, water, and nutrients are mostly absorbed by plants and never leak out into the environment. But the critical part is the high biodiversity. And high biodiversity will also make the soil disease suppressive soil. The microbes, biota, other, they predate on pathogens and create disease suppressive soil. And this is why I mentioned, if you have to use fertilizer, the formula is CNPK. C comes before NPK. And if your C is done properly through rye cover crop or through leguminous cover crop, the need for NPK will be progressively over time, completely removed or mostly removed. That brings me the question of compost. Compost is a decayed organic matter used as a soil amendment. It comprises of a mixture of many decaying organic substances, and uh, it's a very important tool. Uh, three uh, environmental parts, three is environment, energy, and economy. And by recycling of the waste through compost, it really gives you another wealth. Sir Albert Howard, I go back to Indore, designed the compost pit in 1920s. Somewhere you should want to read that design where he was. These days at Worcester, uh, we have a well-defined compost pad uh, with a tile drain system so that uh, fluents uh, can be collected and properly channeled, uh, brought in all the biomass that we want to uh, compost it. Make sure the drainage system goes through a series of ponds so that uh, ponds are like kidneys. They can uh, remove the pollutants before the water is taken away. And the technical potential, this uh, is tremendous. 
as I already mentioned in the previous slide, so I won't uh, take more time. Uh, I realize I may be running out of time, so I'll take five more minutes, quickly give you three ways by which we can implement this concept. One is stewardship, the other is economic, third is legal. Stewardship, uh, we must teach at every level uh, the concept of spiritualism, that uh, natural resources is the God gift, and we must really respect them. I will not go into detail, but whether it's a Judaism, whether it is Hinduism, whether it's Sikhism, whether it's Buddhism, Christianity, Greek, Roman, Islam, all of them teach the stewardship of natural resources, each one of them. And uh, Pope Francis does a great job. I think if uh, a religious leader were to highlight the commonalities among the religion rather than the differences, uh, this Mother Earth would really salute them. Part of that teaching is the population. And I want to share with you two projections. One of them just came out recently, and that is by Walset et al. Uh, 2020 population, 7.8 billion. The right side is uh, UN projections. 2050 is still the same. 2064, the population began to decline according to the one model, <clears throat> keep going up in the other model by 2100. And one model says population can decrease to 8.8 .8 billion and keep decreasing. And that's the part, <clears throat> excuse me, I like to emphasize in comparison with the projection of the UN report, 10.88 uh, billion, 2100. The Lancet study projects world population shows 8.8. .8. Sub Saharan Africa may decrease the population by 702 million. South Asia 584, uh, East Asia another total uh, tremendous less. The total fertility rate uh, at the moment, which is 1.24, uh, may decrease to 1.6. In Africa, 4.6, now to barely 1.7. And uh, even a small change in the total fertility rate uh, can really make a big difference in population. And the two trends driving the fertility rate, going back to stewardship uh, to 2.1 births uh, is possible through education. And that education is part of the stewardship, the modern devices and protecting and strengthening the reproductive rights of women through education and empowerment. So stewardship of the natural resources is very intimately interlinked with the education and uh, empowerment of the women. If we were to be able to do that, <clears throat> rather than increasing the land area under cereal production by another 200 million hectare between now and 2100, we can decrease it from 700 million hectare to 500 million. Total fertilizer use, we can definitely reduce to no more than half. And at the same time, increase the cereal yield to more than double. So that is definitely possible of producing more from less by using best soil by best method. And we should be able to pay farmers for ecosystem services. And my suggestion for payment is $40 per hectare. We can also think about rights of soil, just as universal rights of human, soil being a living entity also has a right to be protected, restored, thrive, and managed judiciously and that right should come. I had quickly wanted to show you what future agriculture may look like. I want to show only the last column, what the priorities are between 2020 and 2050, recarbonization of the biosphere, nutrition sensitive agriculture, eco-instensification, soil less agriculture, phytobiome management, urban agriculture, space farming, but recarbonization, eco-intensification, that is what the future agriculture is going to look like. At the end, I would like to leave a message that degrading land, denuding landscape, recurring drought, intensifying heat waves, low crop yields, perpetual hunger, marginal living, and desperateness 
are bigger threats to global peace and security and they must be effectively addressed. Right now, 17 people die of hunger every minute, every minute. That's the biggest weapon of mass destruction. And the answer to that tragedy lies with farmers doing better and nutrition sensitive agriculture. Thank you. Hi there, Dr. Lau, thank you so much. I think we all wanna just pause in drinking your words. Thank you very much to uh, the noble purpose of your presentation and the inspiration that you provide us to keep going day and today. Thank We're uh, delighted that you are with us. Uh, and we know that um, even if we don't have the privilege every day to see you, your words and your, your beliefs are what will fuel us forward. All of the folks at the Compost Council of Canada in terms of our membership have been breaking down barriers and refuse to accept the word no, it can't be done. And I, I think in terms of in terms of the evolution of our work, where we first started from a perspective of landfill avoidance and are now going further and further and digging deeper into the soil is a testament to you and your colleagues uh, who have always been very generous of giving uh, us support. And so your colleagues within Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada who have never said no to us and have always given us time and space, even when government-wise, the priority hasn't been there. Uh, you are within a, a rare crop of people who have given rather than taken, just like what we have to do is give back to the soil. So thank you so much. It is an incredible privilege for us. And uh, we are so proud to have a relationship with ICA thrilled that you are the soil goodwill ambassador and we look forward to working with our colleagues across the countries to to continue to fish push forward you have an incredible influence one of our colleagues within the european compost network the executive director stephanie said that you presented at the eu and uh, so you are well known in terms of you have um the uh, weight of, of much responsibility on your shoulders. We're delighted you have Maggie as a helper because certainly she is she is a hidden force of strength for you. I, I, if you're okay, Dr. Lal, I have a few questions if you don't mind. Oh, and these are coming from the audience. Thank you. So the, and the first one is, uh, mm. when does the soil reach sea saturation and the potential sea sequestration levels off? That's a very good question. Uh, it's a very scientific question. And we have graduate students who are asked to write the thesis and determining it. In terms of time, if today we were to change from regular system to a regenerative agriculture system that creates a positive ecosystem carbon budget, I would say you'd reach saturation somewhere in about one generation, 20, 25 years. So that is a very quick uh, answer. But if the soils are very depleted, such as those in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and Haiti or other places in Caribbean, uh, uh, South Asia, etc. It may take longer. Uh, start is slow. After five to 20 years, the rate is much higher. After 20, 25 years, it levels off. So about one generation. Thank you. So you're getting a, um, a compliment from the crowd multiplied by, you can't hear all the, the clapping, but uh, there's tons of clapping around the world right now <laughs> because of this. Um, the, the words that have been written are incredible presentation, Dr. Law. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your work. What do you think are the major factors preventing these solutions from being implemented? Translating science into action through political willpower and through judicious uh, implementation. <clears throat> I mentioned uh, some legal options. I mentioned economic option. For example, I mentioned uh, stewardship through religion, through teaching, through education, economic paying farmer for ecosystem services. And please do not confuse payment for ecosystem services with subsidy. Uh, it's not a subsidy. Uh, this is, uh, we are demanding something, we're asking, we're expecting something from farmers. So they should be judiciously rewarded. And then of course the legal, 
I think rights of soil. In the US, uh, we have um, Healthy Air Act or Clean Air Act. We have a Clean Water Act, but we do not have a Healthy Soil Act. So how is it possible to have healthy or clean water and air without having healthy soil? So I'm hoping one of these days that may happen uh, where soil is given the right to be protected and used properly. So those are the three options, uh, but political will, wherever uh, we can implement some incentive scheme, uh, some scheme that supports farmer, that respects them, uh, increases uh, the importance of their contribution to the society uh, and rewards them. Uh, I think those things can certainly be very helpful. Uh, equipment, supplies, uh, resource for farmers, where how they can plant uh, through the residue without burning it or without plowing under, uh, that is another option. But politically translating science into action is the major uh, uh, thing that I hope will happen soon. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to read uh, the message from Percy Foster, who's uh, my counterpart in Ireland with Craig. Thank you, Dr. Lau, for a great inspirational presentation. In Ireland, we are encouraging people to recycle food waste, and I think the link to soil is missing in Ireland. Many thanks from Percy and everyone here in Ireland. See. Thank you. I must indicate I have some very good friends there and sometime maybe ask uh, John Ryan, uh, who is a very experienced uh, person in soil management. Food waste uh, everywhere, including in developed countries, uh, Europe and North America, uh, 30%. Uh, three gigatons of grains produced and one gigaton equivalent never reach any stomach. And yet we want to produce more. I do not understand why. So recycling food waste, preventing food waste, uh, taking personal responsibility that food is not wasted. I think any food waste is really a crime against nature. And uh, we should do whatever we can to safeguard uh, food waste. Uh, and if it is wasted, it is one reason or the other spoiled, uh, recycling back. Uh, I try to do that. I have a garden. I grow a lot of vegetables uh, for home consumption. And most of our kitchen waste, uh, I make sure get back on, uh, on the garden. Uh, and that should be the common practice, food waste eventually being composted and going back to the land where it came from. Thank you, Dr. Lau. So another fan, Dr. Lau, such impressive work. Farmers are amongst the most environmentally aware people on the planet. Unfortunately, conventional chemical dependent agriculture, which is still thought in our agricultural colleges is proven to be detrimental to soil and environmental health. What are your thoughts on how agriculture and farmers can be encouraged to make the transition? That's a very good question. Um, you know, this transition to um, chemical based agriculture happened after the World War II, uh, about 1960, late 1950s. Uh, Haber-Bosch process made uh, nitrogen from inert material in the air to a reactive uh, through that process and fertilizer became economical, also subsidized many places. Uh, and therefore we forgot uh, the recycling process, we forgot compost, we forgot coupled cycling of carbon with water and nitrogen. I agree that judicious use of inputs of fertilizers and chemicals uh, may be needed as long as it is done properly. So it's really a question of education at college level that we should teach basic sciences how to manage soil health, not how to manage fertilizers. And there's a difference between the two. So curricula at the secondary school, I would go as far as primary school, uh, definitely at college level. So let's try to understand how to manage soil health. Remember I was giving a slide, uh, fertility cannot be improved simply by adding fertilizer. Compaction cannot be improved simply by plowing deeper. Uh, these are symptomatic treatments. So somewhere we had to understand and teach how to manage soil health. And in that process, uh, if uh, 
input or supplemental specific nutrients is needed and uh, that could, should be done properly. I'll go back to Leibig's law of minimum. And those of you from Germany may remember Carl Sprengel and uh, uh, John was, um, uh, Van um, Leibig uh, who designed the law of minimum that the fertility of the soil depends on whatever nutrient is missing. Strength of the chain determined by the vehicle's link. So we have to identify what particular element is missing. Somehow we have to supply that. And that is where uh, this science comes in. Uh, do not dump any chemical, apply what is needed properly and judiciously. And please remember the difference between poison and medicine is the dose. Dr. Lal, one of the issues for uh, the fo folks involved in compost is what people put into their green bin. And certainly organic matter is, is looked for, but uh, sometimes there are other additives like plastics and the like, and very difficult to get out before um, the material goes back into the soil. So the question is, uh, the residues of plastic uh, on, what's the issue in terms of uh, the impact on residues of plastic on soil health and therefore on plant and animal health? I was very pleased to read the news today in Ohio, Governor uh, DeWine has uh, banned plastic. I think uh, that's a very welcome news. Uh, it should be really banned everywhere, uh, but plastic should never be recycled back on the soil. Um, the other danger in addition to plastic is the heavy metal. Uh, in urban ecosystems, uh, closer to industry, contamination by lead, mercury, arsenic, many other heavy metals, we want to make sure they do not get recycled back on the land. Otherwise food will be contaminated, produced on that land. So what you uh, must uh, compost, it should be really separated industrial waste from urban bio waste. And in bio waste, unless it's a, a decomposable plastic, um, uh, nothing else should be in it. So careful selection of the plastic material and taking it out is important. The collection system in cities right now, it really does not differentiate between plastic and other cardboard material, for example. Uh, so somewhere um, over time, I guess, uh, through dialogue, education, discussion, uh, we will make sure that plastic contamination should be minimized. Hopefully, uh, like Governor DeWine's uh, ruling today, uh, plastic will be banned from everywhere shortly. Thank you, Dr. Lal. Uh, you mentioned that uh, for carbon sequestration, the farmers should be getting up to $40 a, a, uh, an acre. How, how does that happen? How can we make that happen? Certainly also in terms of right now, compost is not recognized in most schemes as a, as a benefit to carbon sequestration because it's not um, within that 100 years mark. Um, how I calculated that was I um, had the same question asked to me, <clears throat> how much should be farmer paid? So I had to find out what are the ingredient involved in sequestering carbon in soil. So a farmer has a choice of taking the crop residue and selling it in the hay market or to industry construction people who use wheat straw, for example, for construction sites and other industrial uses, or they can put back on the land as I was suggesting for um, carbon sequestration. So the opportunity cost of the hay, which is now being returned to the land, and then we need additional inputs. Uh, for example, hay has carbon to nitrogen ratio, maybe 80 to 100. Humus has a carbon to nitrogen ratio, of maybe 12, 15, uh, 10. So humus is enriched in nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. So knowingly or unknowingly, farmer are paying the price of additional nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur to convert that hay into humus. So I took the prices of Chicago market of the 2013 and converted everything into it uh, and found out to sequester one ton of carbon as humus, how much input is being made by the farmer. And that's what that I came up with price. Some companies have taken that suggestion and are saying, well, rather than $40 uh, per acre or per hectare, I was calculating, 
maybe we can pay half or one third. I salute them for paying, giving something to farmer, but undervaluing a very precious price is not a good idea. Undervaluing a very precious commodity, whether it's water, whether it's carbon, leads to, as we know, tragedy of the common. So uh, a real price should be paid. And the real price, like everything else, keeps changing over time because the price of everything else keeps changing over time. So local economics should uh, evaluate uh, the cost involved. And then this is what I was talking about, prudent governance, political will. This is where the policymakers can intervene and say, if the farmer did this, we will compensate them. And at least in the US, there is a precedence. We had a program called CRP, Conservation Reserve Program, where highly erodible land uh, were asked to set aside, do not plow, and the farmers are compensated. We have 16 million hectare of it, 40 million acres. And farmers are paid exactly what they would have earned if they had grown corn or soybean or whatever it was. So there is a policy. And then many people said, does it mean they have to go and monitor every acre of land? No. When we were telling farmer to do CRP, we did not have a monitoring device at the end of their plot farm to monitor runoff and erosion. We assumed from the Landsat imagery that they were doing what they were supposed to do and we paid them accordingly. Similarly, I think this idea of carbon sequestration should be implemented through payment. I must say something else, and that is the actual demand supply based economic cost of carbon. Because we have not all signed the cap on burning fossil fuel, there is not much demand. Therefore, the market value of carbon sequestered in soil or vegetation uh, is very low. It's not what I gave $200, $220 per ton of carbon. That's not. So that is what I call societal value, what society gains, what the inherent price, and there's a difference between the two. So they should be given right, fair, just price, and given that as what is earned by them through the inputs. It's not a subsidy. Thank you very much, Dr. Lal. And I know that uh, you know the connection that was made uh, with you was the was the work of angels, I believe. And there's a number of angels around the world uh, in, in, that have uh, devoted themselves to bringing uh, the awareness of the importance of soil forward. And you obviously being one of them, we want to make sure that we acknowledge uh, a very precious member of the Compost Council, Dr. Abimbola Abiola, who worked with us at Olds College. In, in terms of uh, the, um, the work that he did in the early 90s, and then in terms of how his career moved forward, he moved into uh, a leadership role to move organics recycling forward within uh, ICA. And so that, that very fragile connection of one person can indeed make a huge difference in terms of Dr. A's connection with you when he was a, a student yes. in yes. your research in Africa and yes. the connections and then the willingness of our Canadian uh, 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 agency uh, with JC and his team. So thank, thank you so very much. And so JC, if you don't mind, if you would uh, come forward and, uh, and say uh, uh, the final words for this session. But uh, Dr. Lau, we, you, you will continue to inspire us. We wish you good soil health thank and you. good health. Thank, thank you so much. You. Thank you, Maggie. Fantastic discussion. I've been very much enjoying this and uh, inspiring presentation. Very well done, Dr. Lau. It's a pleasure working with you. I can call you a colleague now as you are a goodwill ambassador at ICA. Ben Biola is also a colleague of mine. We're working on compost issues uh, in the Caribbean. There's a session on Friday. If you look at the programming on the Caribbean and composting, I invite everyone to join us then at 12.30. I think it is, uh, Susan. And then uh, everyone with COVID, of course, everyone, please stay safe. Uh, at least here in, in parts of Canada where I live, it's, we're in the second wave. So uh, uh, everyone uh, uh, be careful out there. And uh, we've been uh, uh, very happy to, pleasure, to, to participate in this whole week conference and extending the event uh, internationally to our colleagues out in the Caribbean and multiple countries 
following us and my regards to the team and my thanks to the compost council for hosting us it's been a very valuable session we've learned a lot i can tell from the questions there's a tremendous amount of fans uh of dr lala and of this subject matter and i i hope that uh some of it will flow through into practice into our workplace as we uh learn from these sessions and go ahead and grow ourselves from following the growth uh, of our, our soil and our natural resource. A, a precious resource and I thank you once again, everyone. Take good care, merci à tout le monde, c'était fantastique. Uh, à la prochaine, take good care, bye bye now. Bye, thank you.